Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra coming to you on the 14th of March, 2021. We're going to give a lecture today, as the title suggests, Obtaining the Continuum of Carbohydrate Metabolism. And I'm calling it the Lenten Fast because it's in the middle of Lent. Um, what I want to do today is give you some idea of the wonderful complexity of the regulation of a common pathway, the glycolytic pathway. Um, there are many, many, many allosteric, metabolic, uh, transcriptional, recombinational, and post-translational modifications of proteins in the glycolytic pathway, as it is associated, of course, with lactate metabolism, the TCA cycle, and then intimately linked with lipid metabolism. That is standard fare for biochemistry lectures in graduate school, medical school. But I'm going to give you today, besides that, and then after this exception, then go right back into the canonical classical regulation. But besides all of that, I'm going to talk about a totally novel pathway that was discovered not that long ago, which is really fascinating because it demonstrates once again that metabolism is the foundation of the cell. It's metabolism. It's not the level of gene expression because metabolism effectively, demonstrably controls all the expression of genes and all the turnover of proteins, as well as what cells do in terms of fate, uh, longevity, and whether or not, particularly if they're immune system cells, they're expressing pro or anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines and growth factors and transmission factors, all of which will regulate the long-term, um, not only fate of those cells and the tissues that they're interacting with, but the entire uh, human system. So let's get started. With all of that great introduction, I know that you can hardly wait, right? So from the current slide, <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to hide this bar here because we don't need it. Uh, this is my front yard, and these are deer that populate near about the barn in front of our house and some uh, aspect of the orchard. Just to give an idea about how many deer normally do come here, we can get herds anywhere from 20 to 30. Um, so it's pretty extensive black tail deer population. We're on the edge of town, um, kind of like already in a rural area, so they're pretty frequently around here. Anyway, I'm <clears throat> going to give you a broad stroke here at the beginning, which I like to do. The behavior of the immune system depends upon its environment. The classical understanding of the immune system turned on its head, basically. Normally, you think about the, the immune system dictating the environment. Actually, the immune system is controlled by the metabolic environment, both external to the immune cells, be they innate or acquired immune cells, leukocytes and lymphocytes, um, but also at the level of tissue and whole organ systems, and therefore metabolism in general in the body. And that includes nutritional cycles. So hopefully um, I can get you to accept this because it is indeed as close as I can get to the truth of a very complex system. So activated microglia plus blood-derived monocytes compose the population of central nervous system macrophages. We've talked about this in the past. There are functional lineages distributed according to a pro and anti-inflammatory valence. CNS macrophages has contributed to both progressive neurodegeneration and indeed prepare and protect, repair and protection. So they can go on either side of the aisle. Now the activated M1, the classical understanding of macrophages of M1 phenocopy phenotype are pathophysiological, pro-inflammatory, while the activated M2 population are reparative and anti-inflammatory. Reprogramming is variable and possible, obviously, and the variation is obtained by alternate stimulation and eventuation 
of the phenotype. This can involve transcription factors, of course, but as we'll see, the metabolic pathways was controlling those transcription factors. <clears throat> so what are some of the mechanisms that are involved here? I'm sure you know them already, and you know what I'm going to say, and there they are written. Recombinatorial at the DNA level, epigenetic at the DNA, RNA, and protein level, transcriptional, post-transcriptional, and of course, metabolic sequenced mediation. And that includes, of course, post-translational modifications. Right? And they provide an avenue for multiple macrophage phenotypes and, of course, whatever inflammatory sequelae will come from that. Fatty acid versus glucose versus amino acid carbon source alteration are foundational to all of those mechanisms I just mentioned. And then as a result, whatever nuanced immune uh, uh, sequelae follow. So, paper published in Experimental Neurology, uh, just what, uh, July of 2020, so some eight months ago, interferon gamma and the application of lipopolysaccharide, when you add those two together, you stimulate and increase the expression of pro-inflammatory genes, while anti-inflammatory interleukin-4 induces a distinct differentiation pathway. This is how it's done in the laboratory, laboratory setting. So you have inducible INOS, CD86. These are other um, predicates to call it an M1 macrophage lineage. And the arginase CD206 for the M2 population. So these are just some of the um, biomarkers for those two classes of macrophages, both of which can exist as microglia in the CNS, and of course in the periphery of the body as well. So I'm going to show you here, just to remind you about the urea cycle. Start off with carbamylophosphate synthetase. Okay, this is this enzyme that will synthesize carbamyl phosphate or camp carbamyl, yeah, carbamyl phosphate, which is actually a precursor to erotic acid. So this will be a nucleotide pathway as well. Now, in order to get that enzyme to carry out the synthesis, taking bicarbonate, ammonium ion, and two ATPs to make carbamylor phosphate. You need to activate the enzyme. It's activated by this N-acetylglutamate synthase enzyme, which takes acetyl-CoA and glutamic acid and synthesizes this allosteric effector, N-acetylglutamate. So that's how things start. Okay, and then you activate CPS1, you make carbamylor phosphate. <clears throat> so let's go through the cycle real quickly. Carbamylor phosphate synthetase 1, or CPS1, ammonium ions are joined with carbon dioxide and adenosine triphosphate to produce carbamylor phosphate. Ornithine transcarbamylase, okay, this enzyme right here, okay. <clears throat> it'll take carbamylor phosphate and ornithine right there, right? And the ornithine has to be trafficked in through a ONR trap uh, T1, that's the translocator for ornithine, okay? Ornithine comes into the mitochondria because these reactions are all occurring in the mitochondria and these in the cytosol. You make citrulline. Citrulline then leaves the mitochondria and reacts with aspartic acid. The aspartic acid can leave the mitochondrion via the citrin coupling protein in the mitochondrial membrane, okay? So ornithine transcarbamylase, OTC, they carb carbamylate phosphate and ornithine, they're condensed to form citrulline. Both ornithine and citrulline have specific membrane transport mechanisms I just mentioned them to you, ONRT1 and citrin, okay? Third reaction then is arginosuccinic acid synthetase, uh, AS1, and it synthesizes arginosuccinate. Okay, no surprise there. Then the ASL reaction uh, cleaves arginosuccinate to arginine. So this is synthesis of arginine. I mentioned this in one of the audio lectures recently. Uh, and arginine can then be converted to urea, right? So the arginase enzyme is the last enzyme. The reason I'm doing this whole pathway for you is because I just told you that arginase 
is a biomarker for the M2 class of macrophages. Those are the macrophages, to remind you real quickly, the ones that are anti-inflammatory, okay? So for some reason, arginase is active in M2, but not in M1. Now you might wonder why that is, because urea is most common in the liver. That's the major cycle in the liver, but it does occur, occur in immune cells. And one of the reasons it's believed to do that is so that nitrogen metabolism in the form of amino acids can enter into carbon source for the bioenergetics of the immune cell lineage. Okay? So you have to then run the urea cycle whenever you're running nitrogen because you have to have a way of getting rid of free ammonium, which can accumulate because of transamination reactions and the dehydrogenase is associated with aspartic acid, uh, glutamic acid, uh, and all of those dehydrogenases in the TCA cycle, all of which are mitochondrial and functioning at multiple levels, along with the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, when you're thinking about bioenergetics. Right? Okay, so I wanted to show you where arginase showed up. And of course, arginase, the other product is ornithine, and then you just do the cycle over again. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Now, this is the same pathway, just showing you a little bit more detail, right? And this is the mitochondrial portion of it. There's N-acetylglutamate activating CPS1, right? Making carbamylophosphate, right? And then you're making citrulline, and citrulline is leaving uh, the mitochondria and entering the cytosol, arginosuccinate. Also notice that you have, once you make fumarate, now this is in the cytosol, Fumarate can be converted to malic acid, malic acid to OAA via malic dehydrogenase cytosolically. And then OAA via transamination reaction can make aspartic acid, right? And this is one of the ways aspartic acid can enter into the urea cycle. So I'm showing you that this carbon is recycled back so that you can turn this cycle to utilize a lot of amino acids to run portions of the uh, the urea cycle, but also able to ultimately not only get eliminate the ammonium, but the urea cycle is also going to be non-limiting, but associated with the TCA cycle. Okay, so you can get energy out of it in the form of NADH and FADH2. And then upon the reoxidation, of course, electron transport chain oxfos, you can make ATP. I'm not showing you all that now. I'm just giving you uh, another picture, another image of the same thing I showed you, right? And now arginase, right, this really important enzyme here, which is cytosolic, seems to be linked with the M2 anti-inflammatory macrophage microglia lineage. Okay. This is, should be kind of um, a retake of what we were talking about very recently in the audio lectures on clinic biochem. So now <clears throat> you have much more florid detail about this M1, M2 classification of macrophages. There are multiple subclasses of those. Here we have M2B and M2C. They are age dependent and they're also traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, and Alzheimer's disease associated where their activation and residency may be significant in diminishing, because it's an M2 class, right? Anti-inflammatory, neurodegeneration from all of those injuries right? TBI, SCI, and AD, right? Those are all neurodegenerative, right? But if you activate the M2B and M2C, you can ameliorate that neurodegeneration. Um, now that's in younger versus older patients. Now that's interesting. So as you age, the M2 class is less efficiently turned on than the M1 class. So aging then has something to do with carbon utilization, because we already know that M1 and M2 have different carbon utilization, and a whole host of other transcription factors and post-translational modification, et cetera, that occur within those two subclasses. But now I'm laying, layering on the aging process. As you age, the, the system, particularly the microglia in the central nervous system, are less likely to differentiate into the M2 class and more likely to differentiate in the M1 class, which are pro-inflammatory, therefore neurodegenerative. Right? So RNA sequencing of the central nervous system macrophages 
may adopt actually a mixed phenotype when you get something in no matter when you're younger even of a spinal cord injury so this is how you can get central nervous uh, system um, neurodegeneration from youthful spinal cord injury youthful traumatic brain injury and some of that neurodegeneration will carry over during the aging process and thus can lead to in some rare forms but still um i want to put a big caveat there still com not completely enterprised and understood why a lot of tbi and a lot of sci can lead to a um, advanced aging brain in some uh, human uh, dysfunctional systems okay this might be part of it it's because it's it's aging the brain because it's limiting the amount of the m2 class right much like regular aging occurs without having these tbis or scis see phenyl copying all right now I want to mention to you that there are contrarian versus classical CNS macrophage differentiation going on. Let's go, go through this. Classical studies revealed that the M1 macrophages elicited with interferon gamma and lipopolysaccharide or interferon gamma and tumor necrosis factor alpha, pro-inflammatory, right, have increased phagocytic capacity. They secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines, which ones the, the usual criminals, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-12, and they produce high levels of reactive oxygen, which we talked about recently in our audio lectures, while the M2 macrophage is elicited with IL-4, interleukin-4, or 13, release anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10, yeah, and growth factors associated with anti-inflammation. They have low levels, classically, of reactive oxygen, and, and also low levels of nitric oxide production, and they promote stem cell proliferation and differentiation, okay? This is the reparative model of the M2. So the interleukin-4 receptor is essential for M2 stimulation drops as mice age, okay? This is another aging phenomenon, right? If you don't have enough interleukin-4 receptor, you're not going to be able to run the anti-inflammatory sequelae, right? Because that's the, one of the inducing cytokines, right? So that's what this is telling you here. Um, so the M2, uh, the M2 biomarker arginase, because of that, is significantly reduced in CNS macrophages. And that, again, is seen in spinal cord injury. Like, and, and, and that is likened to a precocious aging of the brain regardless of what age you are, see, which can accumulate over time. Paradoxically, however, the M1-specific marker, interleukin-1-beta, is also reduced in CNS macrophages from aged and interleukin-4 receptor deficient mice. So that's curious, right? Why is that particular cytokine diminished um, in the aged model? Well, it could be that there are, of course, other signaling phenomena, right? So it's not really paradoxical. I say it's likely contrarian epimetabolic. It's a term I've, I guess I've coined recently. I keep on coining these terms, hoping people will use them to their advantage. But contrarian epimetabolic, above normal metabolic, only appearing contradictory, right? That's why I'm saying it's contrarian because it was observed in a punctuated experimental setting, right? Mouse model, looking at IL-4 are deficient and comparing them to aged. These are not um, normal native CNS programs, right? They're ones that are induced, which are, are good to study what happens with receptor-mediated induction of neurodegeneration, but they don't necessarily mimic what's going on in the human CNS, right? For two reasons one you got the wrong species and the other is you're artificially altering gene expression which is done all the time again to study specific discrete gene expression now here's where it gets interesting okay so let me put myself way out of the way over here 
Pro-inflammatory macrophage functions include rapid motility, ROS production to degrade bacteria, prostaglandin and cytokine production. Prostaglandin is, of course, coming from the cyclooxygenase pathways and high membrane turnover for phagocytosis, which all makes sense, right? These functions have distinct metabolic needs, including a quick energy utilization. So they're driven by glycolysis, classical anaerobic glycolysis, even though there's plenty of oxygen, the pentose phosphate pathway, and subsequent ADPH production to increase reactive oxygen activity via that NOx enzyme I told you about, the NADPH oxidase system, right? And, but you also get fatty acid synthesis. In contrast, the reparative anti-inflammatory macrophages requires sustained activation to facilitate transcription of tissue repair genes and amino acid and fatty acid breakdown to, of course, produce those growth factors, and that's the energy required. So let's take a look at this. So again, you've got glucose being taken up, running through the hexokinase pathway, making glucose 6-phosphate. There is uh, phosphofructokinase ultimately leading to pyruvate. There's lactate dehydrogenase. All this stuff's going to come up really important soon. Don't worry. There's the pyruvate dehydrogenase pathway with, uh, enzyme, which makes acetyl-CoA. And fatty, fatty acid oxidation will also generate acetyl-CoA. You run through citrate. Now, depending if you're anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory, the pro-inflammatory macrophages okay, are going to make uh, fatty acids, right? And they're going to require NADPH, NADPH from the pentose phosphate shunt, which it means you're going to use glucose 6-phosphate via the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and 6-phosphonogluconate dehydrogenase, not shown, to generate enough NADPH to run fatty acid and cholesterologenesis. This is a pro-inflammatory pathway, okay? And there's the NOx making the ROS extracellularly. Remember, that can move through Hydrogen peroxide can move through as can superoxide through the aquaporin and through other membrane systems that I talked about again recently um, in the audio lectures. So all of this then will help generate inflammatory cytokines. Now, notice that citrate can be uh, converted to itaconate. Now, normally you think about cis which is the intermediate between citrate and isocitrate. But here we've got this new metabolite, itaconate. And itaconate seems to be involved in the inflammatory cytokine production. Okay. It may be, and we, we need to discover why or how it is how it, how that's recovered as a phenotype. Okay. So the metabolic regulator associated with pro-inflammatory microglia are in the solid uh, squares or rectangles. Um, and then the dotted ones, this is supposed to be metabolic regular associated with anti-inflammatory. This is just running your normal TCA cycle and you have a plenty of fatty acid oxidation rather than fatty acid synthesis, okay? So what's going on here, right? Now, here's where it gets more serious and that's why I have to put on my glasses. Because when I put on my glasses, I'm very serious. Here's a paper that goes back to the Journal of Biological Chemistry in 2016 this is authentic biochemistry, so I give you all the background information. This is going to show you normoxic resting cells versus hypoxic with a HIF-1. Um, that's the epoxidy inducible factor one, stabilizing cells. And here is going to be your MLPS macrophage. It's what they're called back in 2016. This is basically the M1, right? The pro-inflammatory, right? So the normal normox are resting cells. Um, Depending on cell type, anabolic processes run in parallel, okay? So you're talking about resting cells using glucose via pyruvate dehydrogenase, right? And then TCA cycle oxidation, right? Um, and that's how you're going to get your energy, right? It's showing you also that you can get glutamate feeding into alpha-ketoglutarate via transamination reaction. Alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase making succinate. You, whenever you do this, you know you can make some NADH. The NADH can be used to make ATP, right? Now, look at the hypoxic cells, okay? Depending on the cell type, anabolic processes run in parallel. Hypoxic cells and cancer cells with a stabilized TIF1 alpha transcription factor uh, expression increase their glycolytic rate, 
they inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase, okay? So that reaction is inhibited. That's why it's, it's filtered out here. It's filtered out because you have this PDK1 enzyme, which blocks the PDH, right? Remember, that's the um, pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. And when you add a phosphate to the enzyme, you tune down or deactivate that enzyme. But at the same time, you're increasing lactic acid production. You also have this uh, uh, pyruvate kinase reaction activating. The M stands for mutational, or that means uh, it could also could stand for metastatic. That particular isoform of pyruvate kinase is, is kicked up. And you also have the amino transferase leading to alanine. So hypoxic cells and HIF1 stabilizing cells, right, up here, they increase their glycolytic rate, inhibit PDH, pyruvate dehydrogenase, and they use glutamine-derived carbon for increased reductive carboxylation of alpha-ketoglutarate. And that's what's going on down here. So you're, you're relying more on the glycolytic, but you also are relying on carbon coming from amino acids, glutamine, okay? So this is the important thing. So you increase glycolysis, but you also increase the utilization of glutamine. Now, maybe you can start to understand why the arginase pathway in the M2 fraction, uh, these are gonna be M1s here, or uh, moving towards M1s, right? Are not gonna be having a lot of high arginase activity because you're not having a lot of carbon coming from amino acid catabolism, right? Okay. And also remember that you, because you can run this, you can synthesize uh, isocitrate from alpha ketoglutarate. Uh, you can also uh, run the aconitase and make citric acid. And that's going to allow you to run that citrate lyase reaction and make acetyl CoA. And when you react acetyl CoA with oxalacetic acid, shown here, you can synthesize fatty acids. Okay. So it's glycolytic. Whenever you get glycolytic, you can be lipogenic. Remember that in the old lectures. But you can also use glutaminolysis and glutamate metabolism to run carbon in this pathway, feeding the fatty acid synthesis pathway. Okay. Now, in the MLPS macrophages, these are the fully blown M1, right? Macrophages show again a stabilized HIF1. Remember, hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha, that's what that is, transcription factor. But they do not decrease pyruvate oxidation through PDH. So the PDH is still cooking here because this HIF-1 isn't in the right um, constant, uh, isn't functioning at the transcription level at the right enough concentration or entering the nucleus sufficiently to block PDH, to block PDH, or also through protein kinase activity. So the PDH is still making a lot of acetyl-CoA as our branch chain amino acid cat catabolic pathways um, so that you can make up, you know, remember that final catabolism is through acetyl-CoA through things like propionyl coa before that. So you can make a whole lot of citric acid. So you have a lot of OAA, you make citrate. Now look what happens. You can make the acetyl coa and make fatty acids, but now you have this alternate pathway where you have cisaconitate converted to itaconate. Okay, itaconate, there it is again, right? You have less isocitrate being made, but don't worry, you still can finish the TCA cycle because you can still use glutamine. Let's go through this blue uh, highlighted region, which describes what I just gave you there. L M LPS that LPS induced macrophages show stabilized HIF1, but do not decrease pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. Under this condition, HIF1 alpha does not decrease increase the pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase one abundance. So it doesn't induce the transcription of that. Remember, HIF1 alpha is a transcription factor. So compared with resting cells, right, less citrate is oxidized to the TCA cycle and is rerouted to serve as a precursor for this itaconate, this unusual intermediate, right, carboxylic acid um, that normally isn't synthesized because normally it's just runs cisaconitate directly as a citrate, right, TCA cycle stuff. Um, and also you can utilize citrate for the fatty acid synthetic pathway, which is your classical um, a citrate lyase reaction. So glutamine will serve to replenish, as I told you, the TCA cycle by increasing carbon contribution to the glutarate, finishing off to succinate. You still probably are using branched chain amino acids in this highly toxic state where you have M1 activation, you have neurodegeneration if you allow these macrophages around. So that's why it says branched chain amino acids can also support carbon supplies because they can feed into the succinate pathway, right?
succinyl-CoA is one of the other intermediates along the pathway. So despite sustained pyruvate oxidation or PDH, oxygen consumption rates are lower than in resting cells because it's not required to reduce a lot of molecular oxygen because you can still run the TCA cycle sufficiently and you can get net ATP synthesis because you're still running glyc glycolysis, right? You can get that ATP directly from there. So macro, so the macrophages in the M1 are still major glycolytic, right? They're not so much fatty acid oxidation. In fact, they'll synthesize fatty acids. This is the bizarre, unique thing that phenol copies, in a way, these prodromal or even these uh, cancerous cells, right? So you start to see how phenotypes can cross over when you're not dealing at all with the same disease state. Here we're talking about pro-inflammatory, which is could be good to destroy cancer, but not good if you have a pro-inflammatory microglia in the central nervous system. This is why papers published way back when that are just looking at these different metabolic states, it's all they're doing, and here they're describing to the itaconate pathway, are basal for understanding the papers that come out later, like the 2020 paper we just talked about. Okay, so let's get into this. Paper again, JBC, the M LPS stimulated macrophage, increased glycolysis, increased lactic acid li release, we know this. Reductive carboxylation of the alpha ketoglutarate is not increased in those macrophages, but instead glutamine is still oxidized through the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Glutamine first to glutamate. Now, what's the distinction there? You have to get rid of the ammonium ion, right? Right. Pyruvate is oxidized through PDH, as we just said, essential for full lipopolysaccharide activation of these M1 class macrophages or microglia from the central nervous system. And also you make this itaconate. Now, let's jump to 2019. Itaconate is one of the best examples of the consequences of metabolic reprogramming during the immune response. It's made by diverting aconitate, cisaconitate, away from the TCA cycle during the inflammatory macrophage activation sequelae. Main reason macrophages exhibit this response currently appears to be for an anti-inflammatory effect because itaconate, as we see, is going to have this function to watch. Itaconate connects with cell metabolism oxidative and electrophilic stress responses, and indeed the immune responses, all of which are in full bore in a pro-inflammatory system. So the role for itaconite in the regulation of type one interferons during viral infection has already been shown and described as well as in the M2 macrophage quiescent functioning that I'm now leading into. Under defined circumstances, this was described um, as a, an episodic observation. Okay. Finally, though, macrophage-specific itaconate has also been shown to have a pro-tumor effect. So all these studies point towards itaconate being a critical immunometabolite that could have far-reaching consequences for the immune response, host defense, and indeed, of course, what? Tumorigenesis, right? So this sounds like a beautiful forest of trees for a biochemist to explore, right? Because how is this now unusual intermediate that's coming off the TCA cycle involved in all of these somewhat diverse mechanistic approaches for bioenergetics and either pro or anti-inflammatory, and then therefore at the higher level regulating disease states, okay? Neurodegeneration versus oncogenesis, for example. Uh, so here we go. Glass is back on because small writing. There's a lot here. First of all, there's itaconate. It's a decarboxylation product of a cisaconitate. Cisaconitate normally is converted to isocitrate. And when that is decarboxylated, remember that's isocitrate dehydrogenase. That's where you make alpha, K, alpha KG. This is the TCA cycle. This is the unusual synthesis of itaconate. Okay. Remember, it's coming from citric acid. It's just showing you where the carbon ends up, right? And as some of that carbon is lost, that carbon is actually lost during the decarboxylation. So let's read what we got here. 
Uh, now this paper came from a 23 from 2013. This is where uh, where this intermediate itaconate is first being examined using mass spectroscopy. Okay, and peptide fragments. You'll see what I mean in a minute because this is going to be an allosteric effector because it's going to be binding to certain enzymes and affecting their activity in this process. Hence, it's metabolic regulation. You get it? Okay. Change in specific metabolites of macrophageal inches have been linked to effector mechanisms and initial examples, including glycolysis and succinate, driving an inflammatory phenotype and fatty acid oxidation, as I've just said, linked to the anti-inflammatory. So fatty acid oxidation, good to decrease neurodegeneration. Fatty acid synthesis, perhaps not good. You get it? So if you have microglia synthesizing fatty acids, that's the antithesis of what you want. You want fatty acid oxidation. Okay? Fatty acid oxidation is a slow burn for ATP synthesis, whereas glycolysis is a high energy burn. Got it? Okay. So let's proceed. So this itaconate, this compound down here, is made from cisaconitate in the TCA cycle and macrophages <laughs> with numerous factors. Sorry, my dog is broken. Rocky, Rocky, hush. Hush, Rocky. Okay. Notably, lipopolysaccharide, but also other toll-like receptor ligands and cytokines. Rocky! Such as type 1 and type 2 interferon. Rocky, hush. Quiet. Come on over here. Sit down. Sit, Rocky. Dog's named after Mark, Rocky Marciano, um, undefeated heavyweight champion um, uh, boxer. Right? Not named after Rocky in the movie, right? Rocky, stop it. Stop. Done. Somebody just, Paul's friends here. Stop. Sorry. Okay, so let's proceed. Itaconase made from cisaconitate, the TCA cycle of macrophages, as I said, with numerous factors, notably lipopolysaccharide and toll-like receptor ligands and these cytokines and interferons. These stimuli increase the expression of the enzyme, aconitate decarboxylase 1, right, or ACOD1, also known simply as CAD, okay? And it was originally called, <laughs> one more name, immune responsive gene. Uh -huh. You see the phenotype being expressed in its name, or ERG1. Okay. So the cisaconitate is a diverted away from the TCA cycle and is therefore repurposed to allow for itaconate production, shown here. If the decarboxylation is performed by a CAD homologue, the first carbon atom of the molecule is expected to be removed during the decarboxylation, resulting in M1 isotopologs of itaconic acid. 45% of the citric acid molecules is M2 isotopologs. Okay, now these are different masses. So this is mass spec talk here. This isn't M1, M2 of the macrophages, just so you don't get confused. These are isotopologs. This is where the carbon flows. That's why it's showing you here in this highlight, why, it's, why I highlighted it up, so you can see where the carbon goes during this pathway. Okay, it's really important to get an idea of how you have isotopic discrimination going on, which means it's an enzymatic mechanism, right? And it's not a decarboxylation that is simply associated with a metabolic fluke, right? That's, that's why when these papers were first done, when this research was first done, way back in 2013, they had to isolate all of these isotopomers to determine where the carbon was going, okay? That's what we're doing here, showing you some actual data, right? I, I'd love to do more of it, but people complain about all the data, so, um, but sometimes I don't care. I'm just gonna show you data, okay? So, Resulting in the M1 isotopologs of itaconic acid, 45% of citric acid molecules is M2s, okay? There's a citric acid M2, right? That particular isotopomer. All right. Whereas 38% of the itaconic acid molecules were M1 isotopologs, you see there, see the M1, right? Here's itaconic acid, right? 
Um, a significant fraction of M2, M3, and M4 isotopologs of itaconic acid were also demonstrated, right? There they are. There's some in the M2 fraction, the M3 fraction, and this M4 fraction. Those are different isotopologs of the same molecule, okay? All right. So I think that's all I have to say. Because of the symmetry of succinic acid, <clears throat> subsequent turns of the TCA cycle result in M2 or M3 isotopologs, once again, of itaconic acid. This is when it was first discovered, and so they wanted to give you a complete biochemical description of how this compound was synthesized. So you use mass spec to do that kind of work. Right? This is just the um, equivalency of the mass spec isotopolog on the y-axis. This is the different versions of it. I just explained to you. Okay, so immune response of gene one protein links metabolism to immunity by catalyzing itaconic acid production. A classical paper way back in PNAS 2013. So it was that eight years ago, right? Not that long ago, I'm joking, but I, I like to show the, some of the original work and show you the data too. Why not? Now we're back up to 2019. Paper published, this is a review article, sorry. Nature Reviews in Immunology, volume 19. Actually, I like review articles. I'm not sorry. Now, Look at this paper here. Resting macrophage metabolism. You just got glucose, glycolysis going to pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to show OAA here, though, but the condensation is citrate to aconitate to alpha ketoglutarate. Okay, and on with the TCA cycle, right? So activation of, micro, uh, of macrophages uh, increases glycolytic flux and the transition towards an anaplerotic TCA cycle with a high production of itaconic acid. See, itaconate is itaconic acid. So check this out. Now, itaconate is going to block the succinate dehydrogenase reaction. It's one of the things it does. Okay? So we add LPS. You've activated now the macrophages, and that's where you're at. So what itaconate is doing is inducing these two transcription factors, NERF2 and ATF3. I talked about these about three weeks ago in video lecture, because I knew I was going to get to this later, and also an audio lecture and probably two of those, right? These are transcription factors that are going to lead to an anti-inflammatory effect from itaconic acid, even though you've activated the macrophage. You understand. So let's go back now. Anaplerotic TCA cycle with high production. So anaplerotic just means feeding in and out of the pathway, right? So in turn, this high production of itaconic acid limits succinate dehydrogenase, boom, blocks it, blocks the activity, blocking succinate mediated inflammatory processes and inducing the anti-inflammatory proteins, just told you about these transcription factors. Uh, the arrows represent general direction of the metabolic flow in the system, HIF1 alpha, of course, we know what that is, IDH, IC3 dehydrogenase, and we know what LPS is, okay? Just showing you now that you do it, you have much weaker isocitrate dehydrogenase activity, much stronger um, uh, itaconate synthesis, giving you this anti-inflammatory phenotype, okay? After LPS induction. So it's a feedback regulation of a stimulation of a pro-inflammatory pathway when you synthesize sufficient amounts of itaconic acid. That's what I just said, okay? Now, this is, again, 2019. All those papers before, the 2013, 2014, 2016 papers preceded this review article, which is now bulking up all of the resonant information we now have on itaconic acid, okay? Because of all the preliminary work, 50, 60 more papers were published to fully describe that itaconate is actually anti-inflammatory because it's acting as a feedback loop. Right? High enough levels of it, it starts becoming anti-inflammatory. Okay. I think I said that enough different ways. So, off these glasses again, my magic spectacles. Itaconic covalently modifies, here's where it becomes very interesting, the thiol groups in KEEP1 and in GSH, which independently contribute to its anti-inflammatory. Now, we don't know what GSH is, right? That's glutathione, right? Through the KEEP nerve 2 I-kappa-B 
ATF3 transcription factor pathway. Okay, so NERF2 contributes to the anti-inflammatory processes by orchestrating the recruitment of inflammatory cells and regulating gene expression through the antioxidant response element, or ARE. The KEEP1, which has a terrible name, I don't know why I can't stand that CH sound, the Kelch-like ECH associated protein, I guess KEEP is better than Kelch etch, right? Uh, or NERF2. So you have the NF, E2, P45 related factor two, that's what NERF2 stands for and the ARE, as I just explained to you what that is, right? So that signaling pathway mainly regulates anti-inflammatory gene expression. Therefore, what does it do? The sequelae of that, right? The end product of that is it inhibits the progression of inflammation, all from iconate, iconate acid, okay? All right, now putting it together here a little bit. Under basal conditions, here you have the keep protein, right? And you have it bound to a chemokine, oh, excuse me, to the cold protein, not a chemokine, it's the cold protein. It's part of the ubiquitin pathway, actually. And that's bound to NERF2. That's at the basal state, okay? So under basal conditions, NERF2 binds to its repressor, which is the keep dimer, in, in uh, the presence of cull 3 that leads to, because cull is involved, that tells you the ubiquitination pathway, leads to ubiquitination followed by proteosomal degradation. Okay, that's what normally happens. Now, during oxidative stress, see, here it is. Here you've got the cull is functioning to set up for ubiquitination of that nerve transcription factor, and it gets hammered by the proteosome. And so you don't get the pro-inflammatory response. Keep is doing a job keeping NERF out of the pro-inflammatory pathway in the presence of the COL-3, which helps set up the ubiquitination pathway. Okay. Now, during oxidative stress, the NERF-2 binds to the ARE. So let's watch this. Free NERF-2 okay, translocates to the nucleus. That's okay. I told you it was a transcription factor, where it dimerizes with members of the small MAF family protein, which is another transcription factor, and it binds to the ARE genes, such as HO1, right? That's the heme oxidase, right? The heme oxidase pathway. Upregulated HO1 catalyzes heme into carbon monoxide. See, I told you that's what it does. We've talked about this several lectures ago. I talked about heme Oxidate, oxygenase, and I told you we were going to get involved in it later on. Here it is. See? I followed through with my promises. So now look what happens. Heme is degraded, carbon monoxide, iron, and biliverdin. We talked about this pathway in the past. But what the carbon monoxide do, does then is it, it blocks the NF kappa B. Okay, so now watch this. Upregulate HO catalyzes heme into CO, bilirubin, and free iron. CO acts inhibitor. Uh, Billy Rubin also acts as an antioxidant. Furthermore, HO1 directly inhibits the pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as activating the anti-inflammatory cytokines that's leading to a balancing of the inflammatory process. This came out of between the early papers and the later review article, 2017. It's a BBA paper, Molecular Basis of Disease. Really good journal, by the way. Underused by scientists and underread by everybody. I look at it all the time. Very good publication. Okay, so now you got the idea of what's going on here. Again, another feedback sort of looping here with the stress, right? So because you're blocking uh, this nerve kappa B, which normally would be turning on pro-inflammatory cytokines, for example, in leukin-6 and TNF-alpha, right? But what HO is doing, what the heme oxygenase is doing, because it's breaking down heme and making carbon monoxide, is blocking all that off. This is directly functioning to block the pro-inflammatory cytokines to enhance uh, anti-inflammatory diagnosis. The major one we normally talk about is IL-10. Okay. I think that's all written there. Okay, so we see where we are now. We see how far we've gotten along. I've described to you now this pathway, right, about anti-inflammation using the KEEP NERF model, which you know is regulated by that itaconate, right? Okay, I already told you that. So now you know transcriptionally, itaconate is working as a feedback loop after activation to be pro-inflammatory 
to yield back to become anti-inflammatory. And there's a couple of levels. One is at the transcriptional level. I'm showing you that here. Now let's proceed. Here we go. Now this paper published um, in 2020, Oxidative Medicine and Cell Cellular Longevity, it's a Ndawi paper, so it's free access. And there's the website to pick it up. Here you're seeing acetyl-CoA. So cis-aconitate is produced in the TCA cycle, as usual. Inflammatory stimulus, such as the LPS, promotes the expression of ERG-1. We know what that is. It's the CAD protein, right? The decarboxylase transforms cis-aconitate into itaconate. See, there it is, right? Itaconate can actually become a thioester after, after uh, reacting with a reduced coenzyme A converted to citromallyl coa and then converted finally to acetyl coa so this carbon can flow back into the pathway right so there's your normal tca cycle you know oaa malate fumarate succinate there's succinate dehydrogenase reaction there okay that's what's going on here there's citrate running through the cisaconitate isocitrate this is tca cycle it's the full cycle here right so let's take a look here because you're making itaconic acid, you get the anti-inflammatory response. So you have the transcription factors working, but you also have this carbon being moved off of the TCA cycle, right? It's being diverted away, right? This is going to also help in fatty acid oxidation because you're not going to yield up, bind up the TCA cycle because you're going to be now, you're going to be lowering the synthesis of NADH and FADH2 from the TCA cycle so that you don't block up the electron transport chain oxfos come from the NADH and FADH2, not from the TCA, but from, that's right, beta oxidation of the fatty acids. Right? And so anyway, that ends on this civil, slibble or CLYBL, right? The citramyl coa is converted to pyruvate acetyl coa by this. The answer is bizarre. It's a citrate lyase subunit beta like. So it's like the enzyme that carries out ATP citrate lyase, but it's only one subunit that does this reaction. Again, the subtlety is where all the complexity and all the beauty and elegance of biochemistry is found, right? And this, of course, allows acetyl coa to be on a cycle, reacting with OAA and running the TCA cycle at the same time as you're doing anti-inflammation because of the itaconate. Now, how does the itaconate functioning as a metabolic diminishment of the pro-inflammatory pathway? Here it is. Same paper, 2020 paper from a um, Endowa Journal uh, publication. Now, this was actually a uh, shot directly. This was a, a screenshot. So CAD synthesizes an itaconate. Itaconate competitively inhibits succinate dehydrogenase. Succinate dehydrogenase, of course, would lead to increases in reactive oxygen, which would lead to HIF-1-alpha, which would lead to the induction of an inflammasome, and then interleukin-1-beta. But you're going to get a decreased inflammatory response because itaconate blocks that, because it acts as a competitive inhibitor of that reaction. But competitive inhibitor of what? For succinate. Okay? There's a metabolic regulation. Also, we already told you that itaconate uh, leads to a, 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 a basically a post-translational modification of the keep protein, which would be, in this case, because it's itaconic acid, it would be an alkylation of this, uh, of this transcription factor. And when you block that, this can uh, this will then not block that, and so you're going to then get transcriptional activation of glutathione biosynthesis and the whole one, which is going to lead to the carbon monoxide. And that's going to then give you a raw scavenging, which is going to block the reactive oxygen pathway, further diminishing inflammatory response. We already told you about iconate with the ADF3. It blocks the I, I kappa beta pathway, which normally would transcriptionally activate interleukin-6. So it blocks that so you don't get interleukin-6. And gap dehydrogenase is also alkylated, as is this enzyme, now, they call it aldoa. We call it in biochemistry normally the aldolase, right? Which takes 
fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and makes DAP and GAP. Glycolysis, right? So you alkylate those two proteins and you alkylate this transcription factor overall at the transcriptional level and at the metabolic level, you're decreasing pro-inflammatory cytokine synthesis because glycolysis would normally lead to interleukin one beta <coughs> and interleukin six from this transcriptional factor pathway. Um, the inflammasome interleukin one beta uh, pathway is reduced because of this blockage of six A dehydrogenase. And I told you blocking keep by alkylating it blocks nerve. And so because of that, nerve, um, uh, the nerve functionality then will allow for transcriptional activation of these systems, which are all, you know, the, the heme oxygenase and the glutathione uh, synthesis pathway, making glutathione, all of which are decreasing the inflammatory response. So this is further shown. Here's an astrocyte. So the production of glutathione and astrocytes shown here, right? Remember you get, you have to have cysteine and glutamic acid and glycine to make glutathione. And glutathione is used, it's, it's oxidized to make GSSG, it's a dimer, right? The same time uh, NADPH is oxidized to NADP. This will take uh, a hydroxy uh, radical, like a, a lipo, lipoperoxy radical, right? And because of glutathione peroxidase, making this uh, uh, this reaction with um, make, reducing this a free radical here will then allow you to make the hydroxyl in the water, right? This is how this is going to remove this lipoperoxide, right? And so this is happening in the astrocyte. The same time you're getting glutathione being utilized in the neuron. We talked about this last time, right? Here's the gamma glutamyl pathway, bringing amino acids into the neuron, the astrocyte functioning with carbon flow via the glutathione pathway. So the synthesis of glutathione is regulating the entire flow of carbon and neurotransmitter activation in the neuron. Right? And that's what you're seeing here. Remember the oxyproline pathway, the gamma glutamyl carrying in the amino acids, right? And then running through glutamine and glutamate, right? And then recombining and running to make glutathione, right? And this is going to be functioning to reduce the amount of reactive oxygen in the neuron. That's what's happening here, right? So the production of glutathione astrocytes in neurons via system X, it's called, um, XAC transporter, that's the XAC, system XAC. So it's got a very funky name. And that's the alanine serine cysteine. That's what ASC is. The MRP is the multidrug resistance protein carrying out this glutathione transporting mechanism, right? It has multiple roles, right? And the rest of these enzymes you've seen before, I already told you what this is. This is glutamate cysteine ligase, glutathione synthase. Here is just the GSSH, GSH disulfide recombination over here, right? Running through NADPH, I just mentioned that. The TRR1 is a thyroidoxin reductase system, okay? I don't know if it's shown here or not. Yeah, over here, right, okay. Thyroidoxin reductase system is also being controlled as an antioxidant, right, as a further carrier of the electron via the glutathione utilization, right? Um, and you have emerging roles of system antiport systems and its inhibition in CNS disorders. And this paper was published uh, in Molecular Membrane Biology, okay? And there's a link for that paper. It's just going, showing you how this links up now with, right, this whole glutathione pathway links up with amino acid transport in normal neurotransmission coming from the astrocyte, right? So this is functioning at the same time that you're diminishing the inflammatory response by synthesizing a right? Right, okay. This is where the glutathione pathway fits in. Remember the other slide, the slide previous. Okay, so here, paper published more recently in Nature Chemical Biology is the following. Itaconic could regulate immune responses via multiple pathways. And that's what we just showed you, okay? Since the electrophilic itaconate will react with any nucleophilic cysteine, which are found in these proteins. So you have aldolase, because you're that 3 phosphate dehydrogenase, and lactate dehydrogenase, that's the form A, are each covalently modified through key cysteine residues by that itaconate, which is an electrophilic 
a substance, okay? Got that? In particular, this paper showed aldolase and lactate dehydrogenase itaconitation inhibits their enzymatic function, it inhibits aldolase and LDH. Now, what are those enzymes? Glycolytic enzymes, inhibiting glycolysis. Remember way back when? Inhibiting glycolysis, decreasing inflammation, decreasing that M1 phenotype right, of the microglia. Right? Thus, suppressing glycolysis and favoring an anti-inflammatory effect, right? So this anti-inflammatory control is reinforced transcriptionally through the KEEP nerve pathway and the ICAPA BATF pathway I just showed you. Itaconite synthesis that serves as a metabolic regulatory circuit to shut down glycolysis while promoting fatty acid oxidation within the innate immune macrophage microglia lineage, including that the microglia, of course, out of CNS, which is where I was leading to, right? So see how this links into aging, neurodegeneration, and spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury, the itaconate synthesis, the inhibition of the M1 pathway by transcriptional and metabolic regulation, so you know, post-translational modification of those enzymes because of those active cysteine residues in those enzymes. So I'm going to pick up that thread later when I generate that entire diet event ontological discussion, which I've been promising to you about aging in the immune system. But right now, we're still pulling that thread out, right? We're still taking Ariadne's thread and we're leading you through that maze, uh, hopefully in, a, in somewhat of a linear fashion. So that when we pull all these threads together, we make a much stronger rope and we can get all the way up to the level of diet event ontological perspective the immune system, aging, metabolism, all three coming together, right? And of course, the epigenetic phenomena we've discussed on and off for the last, what, two months, right? Okay. So this is, allows me to get to the end of this because this is just getting back to the normal regulation of glycolysis. And so I gave you now the alternative, right? Now I can, go, I can show you that Glycolysis is normally regulated by feedback inhibition of glucose 6-phosphate, which, which is the first reaction to take glucose is brought into the cell. Once you, once you make up enough glucose 6-phosphate, you can inhibit exokinase and stop, the, stop glycolysis there. Remember, the glucose 6-phosphate can also be used for glycogen synthesis, the fetus phosphate pathway, and ADPH production. Once you make fructose 6-phosphate, this reaction, uh, PFK1, is activated by AMP and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, which itself is an allosteric effector molecule for PF1, PFK1 coming from PFK2 pathway, right? Um, but ATP, an end product of glycolytic pathway, citrate, another end product, and just protons because of the lactic acid production <coughs> inhibit PFK1, which is rate limiting for glycolysis in most systems, unless HK1 is. And this feedback react, or, or this reverse reaction, which is actually gluconeogenic, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, a free enzyme, right? This bisphosphatase is inhibited by AMP and fructose 6-bisphosphate. So that makes sense because AMP promotes this direction. It's going to inhibit the reverse direction. So not gluconeogenesis, but glycolysis. You get the glycerol out of 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. Remember, this is where NADH is, NADH is synthesized. And that can go on to make ATP. Remember that fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, when it builds up, it will allosterically push the rest of glycolysis through this pyruvate kinase reaction to make pyruvic acid. So that's a positive feed forward um, bisphosphorylated monosaccharide to yield higher levels of glycolytic maximal rate. Right? And of course, ATP and alanine, once again, are going to block this reaction. Alanine, of course, is the amino acid, uh, which can be deaminated or transaminated to make pyruvate. So this is like a feedback inhibition, right, of carbon flowing in from alanine cycle from the muscle, for example, right, the alanine coming through the, from the bloodstream to the liver, right? Um, and as I already explained to you, it's a feed forward reaction if this builds up, right? And the final reaction, of course, is lactic dehydrogenase, and that's why we talked all about this proton coming from this lactic acid synthesis pathway. And now I just explained about lactic dehydrogenase is also controlled by the TCA cycle, itaconate, right? 
So I'm not going to bring that up again because I know it's going to confuse the pathway. So I think I'm going to stop there because that gives you the more traditional biochemistry, classical biochemistry of the glycolytic regulatory pathway, of, of the regulation of the glycolytic pathway. And I'm not going to um, go any further into that right now. I could, as you can see, we could go well into the classical control of glycolysis. I almost was going to do that, but I didn't want to add too much more to the, the material I gave you front loaded on those other really fascinating new understandings of the regulation of glycolysis, because that's where I wanted you to end up uh, with me this afternoon. So again, this is Dr. Dan Guerra. Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, video lecture rather than just an audio lecture, because you got to see the slides. You got to see some of those really important structures. I love structures. I'm a biochemist. And I think that, uh, we, of course, we get more nitty gritty than that. But some of those isotopomer data also, I think, were kind of fun to go over, right? Showing you how people figure out what the structure of a new metabolite is, right? By looking at the flow of carbon, by using C13, for example. Um, and so, and that mass spectroscopy is a wonderful tool in biochemistry. So I've used it myself. At any rate, um, I'm going to leave you for now. Um, and um, when we get back together, I might do another video lecture just to clean up some more glycolytic pathway material. And I'm building to this dialectical event ontological description of how the immune system and aging become dysfunctionally coordinated to either induce neurodegeneration in the central nervous system, such as found in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and prefrontal dementia of the elderly, or oncogenesis, right? And that can be, of course, and not just in the central nervous system, but throughout the periphery, right? And this can also lead to forms of um, the phenotype we get from memory loss associated with advanced aging. And I want to cover some of that too. So why don't we stop here? Uh, this is Dr. Dan Guerra from Authentic Biochemistry Studios on the eve of the Ides of March. Um, and uh, I will see you soon. Bye for now.